Well, international students now make up one out of every four students on some Saskatchewan campuses. At the end of 2022, Saskatchewan had about 13,000 international students, and each of those students pays nearly triple tuition than domestic students. When I came here, my yearly fee was 20,000, and now I'm paying 31,000, right? So in two years, it is like $10,000 of increase, which is like pretty big amount of increase, you know. On Monday, the federal government announced a two-year cap on international student permits. This is in response to concerns that some institutions are relying on international students to boost revenues without offering necessary housing. And while the federal government has yet to release specifics for each province, you can guarantee that this is something our guests today are watching closely. I'm being joined by people in charge of international students at the University of Regina, University of Saskatoon, and Saskatchewan Polytechnic. We'll also to hear from international students about some of their concerns around these changes. We would like to convey to the government, like have a better strategy on coping up with the problems that you guys have rather than targeting a special community on it and then providing them with the best support that you guys can and also allotting them with the adequate amount of resources that is worth their money because they pay a lot of money when they come in and the fee is consistently rising. As always, we also want to hear from you. What value do international students bring to our province? And if you are an international student, we'd love to hear from you about your thoughts on this. You can call 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Well, international students are playing an increasingly important part of our post-secondary institutions in this province. And there are a lot of questions about the role of these students going forward and whether Saskatchewan is able to provide good bang for uh, their buck for students who are paying increasingly higher tuition fees every year. So today we've gathered a post-secondary panel. Joining me in our Saskatoon studio is Tevi Pather. He is the Associate Vice President International at SAS Polytech. Hello. Hi, Hi Alicia. Thanks for being here. In our Regina studio is Isabel Dosteller. She is the University of Regina Provost and Vice President Academic. Isabel, hello. Hello. And joining us on the line is Professor Irene. She is the Provost and Vice President Academic at the University of Saskatchewan. Irene, welcome to Blue Sky. Thank you, Alicia. Good afternoon. Yes, and thanks to all of you for being here. This is a really important conversation to have, and I'm very curious to hear each of your reactions to this news that was made on on Monday. So Ottawa said it could would cap undergraduate study permits for international students for the next two years, approving about 360,000 undergraduate study permits in 2024. So that's a 35% reduction from 2023. So, Debbie, since you're right in front of me, I'll start okay. with you. What's your reaction to wow. that? Wow. Um, you know, the federal government has been signaling for a few months now that this change is coming, but we were all taken by surprise by the announcement on Monday, and especially the, the, the details around the announcement. Uh, the important thing is that uh, current students are not affected by it. Students who hold study permits are not affected by the changes that are being proposed. And... Uh, we are working closely with colleagues from the U of S, U of R, from the colleges, and the Ministry of Advanced Education to figure out the details. I've been in about 10 meetings, six external, six in, uh, four internal this past week. It's, discussing, it's Thursday. Thursday, <laughs> discussing this. Uh, it, there's lots to unravel. Um, so I, I think um, moving forward, you know, uh, I think the intention might be good, but the consequences, we don't, we don't know yet. We, mm -hmm. We're going to try and figure this one out. Okay. Professor Irene, what was your reaction to this? Well, um, we've believed as a sector for decades that we need to be responsible when hosting undergraduate international students. And we've each distinctly and also in complementary ways acted on that, whether it's to have distinct um, support services for international students to make sure that we're looking carefully at housing options, working with our local cities um, on this as well, um, and, and working to be recognised as high-quality providers. So it's not surprising to see that there would be a, a desire to uh, make sure that we are responsible hosts of undergraduate international students. But I agree, I agree that it's fair to say we do have some information gaps and we're really looking forward to that needed clarity which will help students 
and help our institutions to plan and to support international student experience. And Pref- Professor Isabel Dostaler, what what was your reaction? Well, I do agree with my colleagues that it doesn't come as a surprise. We've uh, heard uh, discussion around the country, the concern about housing uh, in our country. I guess the fear was a one-fits-all, you know, solution for or or approach for all provinces, where the reality in each of the Canadian provinces are are different. Uh, and I would uh, like to think I that think Saskatchewan is 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 well positioned in that regard. We might be a little less uh, affected by the cap because there would still be room to grow for all three of us. Uh, What I find a little sad, however, is the potential impact on our country as a whole. You know, we know that our international students are attracted to Canada. Our country has a good reputation. Now, what will this mean um, over the long run? That de- That's the piece that I find, uh, that I do find worrying. Interesting that you say room to grow, because some of the economists we spoke to said that, that Saskatchewan could potentially see an increase in the number of international students, depending on how this all plays out. So, Mr. Pathard, what, what, what's your sense of that? I mean, I want to know what happened in all these meetings and all the questions <laughs> you're asking, but but how, how do you see this impacting Saskatchewan's institutions? You know, th- there's potential that we could see growth, uh, but, you know, with the suggestion that uh, spousal visas uh, will not be, uh, work permits will not be available for undergraduates moving forward, could have any impact. So, you know, it's back to trying to figure out the details. Uh, yes, as uh, Isabel has mentioned, there's this potential for room for growth. Um, we have not, uh, we're at one and a half percent right now in terms of the overall international student pop- population in the country. And if we get up to three percent, certainly there's room for growth uh, in the undergraduate uh, student population. Okay. So maybe we should back up just a little bit and, and give people some context. I did say in the introduction that on some campuses, there's one in four students would be international. Professor Irene, do you want to give me a sense of of what, what the, the makeup is at the U of S and, and just what... Um, what percentage of international students you see at the U of S? Thank you. So we have always... Um, sorry. I beg your pardon. I, had, I think I had an echo there. I fixed that. So um, we're, we're really excited to be um, hosting about 3,500 international students at the University of Saskatchewan. That's about 14% of our total student population. And of that, 9% um, of our um, of our students um, are at the undergraduate students. So that's just under 2,000 undergraduate international students. And then over at the University of Regina, Professor Dostelaire, what, what is the makeup there? A slightly higher proportion. So right now it's around 24% uh, of our student population uh, that are international students. So f- a, 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 a little above 4,000 uh, students. And um, three quarter of this 4,000 are um, undergraduate students. So a, a fairly... Um, large uh, group of international students and and we're you know really really excited and and proud about this and at Sask Polytech uh, we have about 28% of our 28% student, 28% but spread over four campuses okay so there's no concentration in one particular campus and, and we're managing the growth that way Okay. Okay. So why don't we talk about some of the the key questions that each of you have before we play some reaction from an international student. So uh, since you talked about the meetings you've attended this week, why don't you start? What are some of the key questions that you're asking right now? You know, clarity about about the in terms of details around, uh, you know, Extensed uh, post graduation work permit, you know, uh, who qualifies for the three year uh, post graduation work permit. Apparently, um, uh, students who are in graduate programs, we offer postgraduate certificates. Do they qualify? Hmm. Those are questions uh, in terms of uh, caps. What does it mean? You know, who does it include? Uh, uh, in terms of the undergraduate students, student, uh, students on exchange, you know, does it include visiting scholars, et cetera? So there's a lot of questions that we're trying to figure out. And what were the changes for people's spouses? Can you clarify that? So um, um, up until now, uh, a student uh, coming to study in Canada can apply to have an accompanying spouse, and that spouse can apply for a 
post uh, a work permit, an open work permit at the time of application. And that's really valuable. I know for most of our students who come to Saskatchewan, they're thinking about settling here. And they come with family, not most, but some of the families, some of them come with families. And uh, that uh, work permit is is an important component of their decision making. And I, I think some of the criticism that we've heard is that they would likely be living in the same house. So a, a person, a spouse on a, on a work permit yeah. would not be taking up potential um, apartments, that right. sort of thing. So, Professor Irene, what are the key questions that you have right now? Well, I'm glad my, my colleague there raised those those particular questions. In addition, we're thinking through what does it mean for the students or the, the potential students who are in the pipeline right now? And so they're across, they're overseas, they are aspiring to come here to Canada. I mean, I, I myself, I've, I've been an international student coming through to Canada and having a life-changing experience from being in high-quality post-secondary education and, and wanting that to be possible for more students. So there are students away um, who are aspiring to be here. They are in the process of admissions. Where do they sit in this? And we're really feeling for them and would, and would really uh, uh, welcome clarity. Professor Dostelaire, what are your key questions right now? The um, new uh, regulation that uh, applicants will need a provincial attestation. So we, our students need a uh, study permit issued by RRCC, and there has been uh, a lot of uh, – it, it, it takes some time to, to obtain, and not all applicants are successful, and sometimes for reasons that are, that are a little obscure. So to add to this, this provincial uh, attestation, it's going to be interesting to see how this can be worked out. And, um, you know, we'll need uh, time is of essence for us. Uh, students apply, and they, they de- do need uh, a response. There's competition in the, in the international field, so we need to be well-equipped to be able to to uh, provide quick answers to to applicants. So and there's uncertainty around that. Would these be students who are looking to start the school year in the fall? Yes, September. it is. In yeah. September. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, let's hear from a current student. So Gurbaz Singh is Vice President of Student Affairs for the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. He's also an international student from India. I think it's uh, for the side A, like if I go for one side, I think it's an interesting decision because it's not bad to limit the number of students that are coming to Canada as international students. It's actually a good thing for the authorities and the government to manage and check their resources as the population is rising on both in the international part and the domestic population. So yes, it's, it's, it's an okay decision. On the second part, if I look at it from a perspective of an international student that is trying to come in Canada mm-hmm. rather than the one who's already residing in, It takes a great deal of planning your work schedule and your finances and your emotional commitment and your education to come to Canada and start a new life away from home and to get better education. And as you know, the job crisis and the housing crisis is Canada is already overstressed because there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And if you still let a lot of students come in in bulk and you don't provide them the adequate resources that they need Mm -hmm. to have a better life in Canada and a better educational support, it's actually doing injustice to them and causing them unfair treatment in all the sectors. Mm-hmm. So all in all, it's a, a hollow decision for me, in my opinion, and it requires more, what do you call that, feedback from the international students and also some checks from the government on their internal reserves of the resources that they're going to provide. The government talking about uh, the stu- housing crisis being uh, led by the international students that are coming in, but I would say it's completely vague and completely targeted because there's not only international student population that comes to Canada for studying. You have different kind of immigrants that come from all around the world who are not the students, but also contribute to the increase in population in Canada. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what the feeling I feel for now, because being part of the international community, you feel a bit targeted when you're talked about on national television. I would like to convey to the government, like have a better strategy on coping up with the problems that you guys have rather than targeting a special community on it and then providing them with the best support that you guys can and also allotting them with the adequate amount of resources that is worth their money because they pay a lot of money when they come in and the fee is consistently rising. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say that the government should have better plans on 
constructing the way out in this kind of situations. So that's Gurbaz Singh, Vice President of Student Affairs for the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. He's also an international student student from India. Mm-hmm. So I'd like all three of you to share your thoughts on, on what you just heard. Clearly, he brings up he, his point is that the housing crisis is being blamed on international students, and he's calling that into question. And so what is the reality in this province? Professor Irene, since you're connected to the U of S, uh, and that's where Gurbaz Singh is a, is a student, why don't I start with you? What's the reality in this province when it comes to housing and uh, and the connection there, if there's a connection with international students? Well, here in the province of Saskatchewan, we're not immune to the housing pressures that are faced across Canada, you know, in terms of affordability, both, both on and off campus. Um, and so we do work through the affordable housing side. At, at the University of Saskatchewan, We're fortunate to be able to um, offer fees for University of Saskatchewan residences that are affordable and um, to have residences that are conveniently located through the campus with built-in student resources, resident support and study spaces and so on. Um, And we do have a high number of applications for those. Currently, we're sitting at 100% occupancy, and that's compared with 96% in previous years. So there's clearly demand there. Um, But we we need to partner up on this, and so we're very appreciative of the um, discussions that we have with the city here in Saskatoon in particular. And it can be stressful, so we ensure that we provide those wellness supports that Others have talked about here, the, the, my colleagues, and we help students with finding off-campus accommodation um, as well. I'm wondering about that, because if, if the on-campus residents are at 100% capacity, how many people uh, would potentially be on a, on a waiting list, and, and what's the available housing off-campus, do you know? Well, it, it does fluctuate a bit, um, but what, what we do know, what we do know is that there is demand for both the on-campus and the off-campus, and sometimes that's because of a preference, um, and sometimes it's because you weren't able to actually um, secure the um, on-campus housing. So that's why we work with the students to um, support them in their um, finding of off-campus accommodation, and that we're partnering up with the city on looking at that medium to long-term um, solutions, um, picture, you know, developing those solutions. Because we have heard from some students who prefer to live off campus so they can split mm. the rent between more people. Have you heard that too? Oh, yes. And I, I mean, I've done that myself as an international student to, to Canada. There were five of us. I had a what you would call a bed room. It was a bed <laughs> and, and, and a little bit of um, floor space to get around. It, it, it's, um, you know, it, it is the part of the experience uh, and that's why we make sure that we're there to support the students through that. We have an international student support centre that, is, you know, it's dedicated to supporting our international students and their success here. Okay. I want to talk about housing with the other two guests too, but I'll maybe read this email and then we'll check in with our newsreader, David Shield, before we get into that Mm -hmm. conversation because I want to give it proper time. So Ellen sent a note writing, as an undergrad, I didn't have many international students in my classes, but in grad school, most of the students were international. This experience had the benefit of traveling the world while attending school in Saskatoon. I had friends from France, Germany, Spain, Argentina, Romania, and China. I can understand heavily accented English better than others that haven't had such exposure. There's a benefit of having a classroom integrated with people from different parts of the world. We can prepare local students for a global economy by knowing and understanding people from a variety of other cultures in a technical or academic environment. There's a financial benefit to the institutions, but also the benefit to local students should be considered in this discussion. Ellen, thanks for sharing your thoughts. We really appreciate that. You can email to bluesky at cbc.ca. You can also call us and join the conversation, 1-800-716-2221. We have three guests with us today. We've got Tevi Pather, who's Associate Vice President International from Sask Polytech, Professor Isabel Dostelaire, University of Regina Provost and Vice President Academic uh, in our Regina studio. And then we also have Professor Irene, Provost and Vice President Academic at the University of Saskatchewan. We were just talking about the housing situation uh, in Saskatoon. Professor Dostelair, I'd I'd like to go to you now. What is the housing situation in Regina and what impact are international students having on uh, the amount that's available? 
Well, we do have a uh, capacity to accommodate students in our on-campus residence. We're, we're certainly not uh, at full capacity. Um, we like, and it's true that uh, international students and students, you know, tend to like to live off campus and share uh, places together. We like to think that uh, Regina has a, a, a lower uh, cost of living than, than elsewhere. Evidently, you know, it's still, there's still financial strain, but we'd like to think that we're we're well positioned in in, in that regard, um, and we do have uh, initiative and opportunities for our students to save money when staying in residence. Um, housing is 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 certainly an important cost in in, in our in our student uh, budget, but there's other things that we can do to uh, alleviate the pressures. Uh, you know, open education resources. You know, having zero cost uh, material for uh, for our student. That's one way to to, to help them. Um, and so all sorts of, of of ways that we that we um, we use to try to to help our students. Okay, Mr. Tevi Pather, what is your sense of the housing situation? You know, like uh, Professor Irene, uh, I was also an international student, and when you talk about housing, I have a little flashback here, (laughs) but it is a very important issue. Students do factor that into the decision-making. You know, it it comes down to the question of uh, affordability versus availability, Um, and, you know, we have seen over the last, uh, you know, uh, since 2022, we had a CMHC report that said, uh, Saskatchewan had a better than average availability for apartment rentals. Uh, Renters.ca in, a few weeks ago said that Saskatchewan, Saskatoon and Regina sort of ranks at the very bottom in terms of uh, uh, cost of rent. Uh, you know, so so very um, accessible. The challenge is that uh, students often have the, to face the the cost of of the apartment and decide whether they want to invest, you know, in a single bedroom apartment versus sharing. And the students prefer that. With with us having four campuses, once again, you know, our students are spread out, and, the and commu- spread out around the province, around the province. Moose Jaw, obviously Saskatoon, Regina, right. uh, Prince, Albert. Prince Albert, and the communities have welcomed them. And you know, uh, coming from the province of BC, where I work most uh, for the last. 25 years, I've seen communities there sort of respond and you know support students to through secondary suites. I think uh, in the last budget, the provincial government announced uh, a credit for people who renovated their suites to create uh, extra accommodation. And so I think with those things uh, available, it's we've been able to manage uh, to a degree. Uh, housing students. So am I hearing all three of you correctly? Am I, am I understanding your perspective on this, that really the story in Saskatchewan is different, uh, yep. it, you know, from what you're seeing, yep. uh, and that, that that link that is being made between international students squeezing the housing, um, the, the amount of housing that's available, the story may not be, that may not be the story here. Yep. Okay. While we're on the topic of housing, this might be a good time for people to weigh in with their thoughts. You can call us 1-800-716-2221 or email bluesky at cbc.ca. Let's go to Dwayne, who joins us right now in Carrot River. Hi, Dwayne. Hello. I just had two quick questions for your panel. Okay. One is that are there is there one dollar being spent by the provincial government on seeing that foreign students uh, get an education, uh, especially when we can't seem to find enough money for our public schools. And secondly, is there a seat for everyone at the technical school and the university for a Saskatchewan student to be taking what they would like to take and they're turned away because there isn't enough room to have them and uh, a foreign student. I'm a retired teacher. I'm all in favor of education, but I do think we have to look after our people first. So I'd like an answer to those two questions. Absolutely. Okay, fair question. Thanks, Dwayne. Appreciate it. Uh, Professor Irene, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, the, the good news here at the University of Saskatchewan is that we have room for more. Um, of course, that means you know really careful planning because we have excellent uh, instructors at research facilities, community engagement. We have approved at the t- at all levels of our university that we can go to twenty nine thousand 
as a as a university. We're sitting comfortably at the high 26,000, 27,000. And so coming out of COVID, we're asking ourselves, what what next? Where to next? Um, and, and looking at student needs, student experience, and I hear that in what you're saying, Dwayne. I'm a, I'm a trained elementary school teacher myself, so I understand, you know, you're wanting to think about the whole learning journey for students. Um, and so we actually are launching this winter, this winter term, um, a task force looking at our enrolment management. And this question of, while we have that go ahead to go um, a little larger, what will what will we do next? So there's room for domestic and there's room for international. We are aiming to have that lift um, in terms of undergraduate international students from 9% of our makeup to 10%. And there'll still be room for um, all, all to be able to come into the University of Saskatchewan you know, for the, the quality experiences that we have here. Okay, Professor Dostelaire. Uh, so our numbers are a little uh, a little lower. So right now we sit at 16.7 thousand students. For us, uh, this is this is a considerable uh, a comfortable number. Uh, we are a university that is. Pri- proud to be accessible, right? So we we welcome uh, quite a large number of, of quite a large number of applicants uh, find a seat with us. Of course, there are fields and programs where yes, competition can be can be a little higher. So some uh, programs are extremely popular. Computer science is one, certainly engineering business. But all in all, we like to say that uh, we are an accessible university. But it is true that the education system needs to be seen as a whole and how uh, our uh, governments uh, invest in uh, primary education, K-12 and, and university. We, we like to say that Universities are our public good. Our system of education is a is a public good, and it's so important uh, for governments to to support it. So yes, there's of course tuition that is a large uh, part of of uh, we need. Uh, it's it's a significant revenue for us, but the. The government funding is also very, very important to be able to, you know, support the numbers, uh, number of students that we have. And just to get a little bit more specific with Dwayne's question, he's asking, you know, whether any provincial money pays for international students. Is that is that the case or? It, it's it's hard to associate. We do receive funding from the government, and that goes to the you know university as a whole. And then there's a tuition that yes is a little higher for international students, uh, which is normal considering the fact that uh, domestic students' parents are the one uh, paying taxes to, to support the system. But it's really hard to associate you know government dollars with with uh, uh, specific seats for international national and, 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 and uh, domestic students. Mr. Pathard, what would you like to add to uh, this? Duane, I can say at SAS Polytechnic, international students pay the full cost of tuition. Uh, in 1996, it started off at UBC uh, where they decided to de-link uh, dom- dom- international tuition from domestic tu- tuition and charge the full cost. And that trend spread across the country. Not everyone has adopted that, but I, at SAS Poly, international students pay the full cost of tuition, and their tuition contributes to making available certain programs that would otherwise not be available to domestic students. Uh, do we pr- give preference to international students over domestic students? No. We have offer about 185 programs. We only make about 65 programs available to international students based on seat availability. When there's a demand, we can also add cohorts. And, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, opportunities for growth. We're working on a growth plan now to look at what that might look like uh, in the coming years. I can say in the last three years, we've gone from about 1,600 faculty staff to about 1,900. So international students have created jobs in the, and, you know, contribute to the economy. It, it, just to, to kind of push a little bit on that or just to help me better understand – how much do each of your institutions re- rely on on the tuition paid by international students? I- I'm wondering how much it makes up um, in your total 
total budget, there might be a perception that in order to, to keep offering programs that you do really rely on international students to be attending our, our institutions. So I'm just wondering about, about that. Professor Irene, how, how much do you rely on the tuition that international students pay? What, what, how much of your overall budget is made up of from tuition from international students? Overall, the international student contribution ranges between 11 and 21 percent of our um, of our overall undergraduate tuition. So that the international student component is important. Student fees at all levels represent slightly less than 20 percent of our total revenue. So it's, it is important in order to be able to resource all of the great teaching experiences, the research and such that we have here. But it's not the only source of um, revenue for the university. We're, we're very grateful for the grants and um, the uh, support from alumni, partnerships with industry, the support from provincial and federal government as well. What would be the impact, though, if we were to see a reduction in the number of international students you were able to accept? Professor Irene, I'll let you keep going on that one. Well, as I, as I was signaling in the opening remarks about the scope, you know, the balance um, between international and domestic, we're, we're feeling um, like we've, we've got a good balance for our, for our particular university and the offerings that we have across the 90 or so programs that, that we offer at undergraduate level. Um, and we're not anticipating that there will actually be a, a decline as a result of the federal initiative. We're thinking, on the contrary, that Saskatchewan as a province is well positioned to be looking at um, welcoming more um, international students where that's appropriate um, as well. And that, that's where we need that clarity coming ahead. Professor Dostelaire, what about the University of Regina? How much of your overall budget is made up from tuition from international students? So our overall budget is $253 million for the current academic year, and about $45 million of this will be from uh, uh, international student fees, so about, uh, approximately 18% uh, of our budget. Um, we don't... Uh, and tend to, we're comfortable at the number we are at right now. About a quarter of our student population uh, is is uh, from international, our international students, and we're we're happy with that with that number. Uh, but you know, I'd like to say that in addition to, it, it's easy to see. Uh, or to consider international students as a way for universities to make easy revenue, and I think it's it's a wrong it's a wrong way to see things because there's so much uh, richness that come from a diverse environment for for our students to to study. Uh, you know, people from uh, elsewhere bring different experience, uh, knowledge, global perspective, and that is really important, and it does enrich the experience of our domestic students. And mm -hmm. as well, we need to remember that, yes, international student is, is, is higher, and it's a way for us to keep our domestic uh, tuition affordable so that that is something that needs to, to that we need to keep in mind uh, when you know when when we make the assumption that uh, we invest or too much public funding in, in in helping international students to study with us we aren't too far away from budget season and so I'm just wondering how provincial funding has changed over the years and what kind of impact that's had on post-secondary institutions mr Pather I'll have you yeah um, start. you know once again coming from the province of B See, I think uh, Saskatchewan has, is fairly well funded by the provincial government uh, in terms of post-secondary education. And so certainly, you know, we've seen, like all over the country, there's been inflationary costs that surged over the last year and institutions have been adjusting. Uh, but we are not overly reliant on international tuition to, uh, you know, address any uh, shortfall. We've been fairly uh, balanced in our sort of approach, um, you know, if I could just sort of add to what my colleagues have said, you know, yes, tuition revenue is an important component, but it's not the component that we focus on. Um, you know, the the opportunity as the person who emails you for a global perspective, perspective is, is vital. Uh, you know, two years ago, um, the Ministry of Advanced Education, together with uh, colleagues from the colleges, U of S, U of R, uh, and SAS Poly, we, we worked on a strategic plan for global engagement for the province. And two of the pillars uh, was talks about supporting the growth plan uh, for the province 
in terms of bringing international students here, supporting growth of the province. And we've seen that. I think just the other day you said 14,000 new yeah. residents in Saskatoon and they contribute to the economy and they contribute to, to life in the province. I want to ask you more about that, just how many students stay in the province, what, what your sense is of that. But I just want to put the question about provincial funding to our other two panelists today. So, Professor Irene, uh, how have you changed? how have you seen provincial funding change over the years? Well, we have a somewhat unique relationship um, and funding arrangement here in Saskatchewan, which has meant that we've had stability in funding for four years. Um, and that's meant that it's been possible to do strategic planning and the recovery from COVID and then to look at how we might be able to innovate as well. And this is a, a very special relationship um, and arrangement with our, our government and um, you know, we can be uh, appreciative. Uh, you know, there are some pinch points with that that we that we work through, but it has certainly been important for providing um, stability. Um, and what that's meant too is that um, because of the way that the the funding has been set up here in Saskatchewan, that we haven't had to um, move away from the the. the the learning commitment, the teaching commitment, the diversity commitment that's represented by international students being in our community, we, we haven't had to have a, you know a compromise on the, that standard, on that principle, uh, or go for money grabs and, and such with that. It, we've been able to um, enter into this in a way that is about growing the Saskatchewan um, as a province, being ready to embrace all of the opportunities that are here in this province and the shortfall that we we have in the needed um, skilled workforce and that we as a post-secondary sector are all um, you know, contributing to the Grow Saskatchewan plan and, um, and, and what's going to be needed as we, as we continue to grow as a province. I don't know if I fully understand why why tuition has gone up as much as it has for international students, and we'll get to that in a second. But just first, Professor Destelaire, I, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on provincial funding. Is there anything you want to add to the conversation? Sure. Uh, I recently uh, moved to the to the province. I'm I'm in my new role since uh, last June. Um, it's such. A, I, I come originally from the province of Quebec, where there's a multiple number of universities. Uh, I worked in Newfoundland, uh, where there is one university, and then here in Saskatchewan, where we have a three post secondary uh, education institution. Uh, what I really appreciate, what I appreciated in Newfoundland, and I can appreciate here, is the opportunity for a very close relationship between government and the post secondary. And this is good because it allows all three of us to really make a strong case uh, for uh, the value we we bring to the province. So that is a that is a unique situation uh, in Saskatchewan, and I think it's it's it it works to our to our advantage. Yeah, I think if we were to survey students, they would talk a lot about the increasing cost of living and and how much university costs, and of course rent has gone up. You know, it, it, we'd probably hear hear some different stories if we if we surveyed a few students. And yep. we do have um, one student that will will play a bit of tape for you here. So Hamid Amanda is at the U of R. He's a third year computer science international student from Bangladesh. I mean, I know why they're doing that, but I believe it's putting a lot of people in difficult situation, a lot of aspiring students, like they're planning to come into Canada to get higher education, but I mean, for two years, it's going to be like pretty hard for them to come in. They'll be wasting like maybe two or one or two years in that. When I came here, it was like pretty like good conditions for like even for getting jobs, housing and everything. But recently, like I have seen a lot of people come in here, and they come here, they don't find any jobs. Uh, like housing is like pretty like everything is expensive right now. The food. I remember when I was here, two hundred dollars of grocery was enough for me to last a month, yeah. and now even five hundred dollars seems like not enough. You know, yeah, everything is like all the prices are rising. Even the tuition fees here. Like when I came here, my yearly fee was twenty thousand, mm -hmm. and now I'm paying thirty-one thousand. Right. So in two years, it is like ten thousand dollars of increase, which is like pretty big amount of increase, you know. But sometimes they, they do help students with financial helps and everything. So this is also a good thing for USASC. Yeah, like um, I'm getting top quality education here, which I was not getting back home. And I have a lot of friends 
who are uh, qualified, even more qualified than me to come here, but I guess they will face a lot of challenges to come here since they have um, applied this uh, student cap, international student cap. Ahmed Amanda is a third-year computer science international student from Bangladesh. Now, he brings up a few points there, one talking about the cost of living, uh, how much his tuition has gone up in the last couple of years. So since he's a, a U of R student professor, Dostalera, I'll, I'll start with you. Thoughts on what you just heard there? Yeah, it's it, there's no it's it's a difficult situation, and, and we know how inflation has been high and and situation has been difficult for, for our students and also many, many, many people in, in our society. But I'd like to, us to remember that even as, yes, tuition has, has increased, we still offer quite competitive, um, you know, our tuition is quite competitive compared to what can be uh, charged in, in other provinces and certainly certainly in other, in other countries. Um, as well, um, we try to provide as much opportunities that we can to our students uh, for employment on campus. We have a fairly uh, robust co-op uh, program. That's another uh, opportunities for students to to um, to get employment and, and, and additional revenue. I mean, you know, for sure, situation is 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 certainly hard in in, in many cases. But um, apart from that, recent uh, uh, surveys indicate to us there was a survey conducted by the Canadian Bureau of International Education where. Um, We've scored quite well. 500 international students were surveyed and they indicated that they would promote the institution where they were studying uh, to, to other students. So all in all, of course, when we talk to and we, we take individual cases seriously and we try to support our student, the health and well, wellness of our students is important. But all in all, we, we like to believe that uh, we provide uh, a valuable experience to, to all of our students. And what about that question where I was, I'm trying to understand why it has gone up? So much. What happened there? Well, th this is you know, and, and and the way our tuition increase is is regulated, uh, we cannot go. Uh, you know, we're not free to increase uh, as as we want. But it's it's a university is also an exp an expensive business to run, right? The, the cost of education is is important is is expensive. Um, salaries are expensive. Everything increases every year, so that explains our our need. To, to 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 increase tuition once in a while, but we tried to do this in the most uh, responsible way possible. Did it go up more for international students than it did for domestic students? I think that's the part that it's been a long time since I've been at a post-secondary institution. But was that part of the conversation that was taking place? Why so much more for for international, or why such an increase for international students? Yeah, it's too early to tell for now, and it's something that uh, you know I I I don't think we we need to uh, be. I think we can be optimistic about about how tuition will be in, in years to come. Professor Irene, I'm wondering how much you know about the limits there will be on students' ability to international students' ability to work. So my understanding was for a number of years there were, there was a cap on how many hours they could work that was lifted, but now it's it will be reinstated. Um, and so I guess it, I'm wondering what the limits are on work. And then the second question is, if there are limits on work, can international students really afford to to live and study here? Hmm. Um, so it is, as you, as you stated, that there's been an adjustment to the hours that can be worked. Um, with that, though, we're always wanting to ensure that we um, support student success. And so alongside students being able to have um, employment, whether it's all through the year or through that summer period if they structure their program in that way, um, post-secondary providers um, like the University of Saskatchewan provide um, awards, bursaries, um, scholarships. We ourselves, we have, a, we have a fundraising campaign, a comprehensive campaign around being the university the world needs. And for us to each be the, what the world needs, we have that underway currently. And of the four pillars in that um, campaign, one is dedicated to students. And we're so appreciative of the support that's coming in and others believing in the power of education. 
Um, and for the province overall, we do actually want to encourage more people to come to our post-secondaries and then to become part of the workforce. That's exactly, have, that actually leads to my next question. We don't have yes. a ton of time and I want to give everyone the opportunity to comment on do most students, international students, stay in Saskatchewan? Do they build a life here? And I, I'll have to limit you to about 45 seconds well, each. Well, you know, uh, Saskatchewan Polytechnic graduates, uh, 95% of them get a job uh, after completing our programs. Uh, here? In, in well, Saskatchewan. And about 90% of our students who have a post-graduation work permit stay for at least a year. We estimate, and we're trying to get the data on this, is about 60% actually stay on based on five-year tax records. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's significant. And, uh, you know, uh, we'd like to see that continue. Professor Dostelaire, what's your sense of whether or not they stay? They do stay. And again, I'd like to uh, to refer to this survey I was mentioning. So this survey indicated that uh, the students that were surveyed indicated their wish to stay in the province. It's not just about finding jobs in the province. We try to uh, uh, inspire our students to be entrepreneurs. You know? So mm -hmm. uh, some of them who stay in that province, uh, in this province are not just staying here to find jobs, but to create jobs. So that is a, an important part of what we do to try to push uh, students in, in, in this innovative and, and, and entrepreneurship mm. uh, spirit. And Professor Irene, are they building a life here? Yeah, um, predominantly, yes. Uh, but there is a whole life journey. So um, some will go out and then they come, they come back in. And it's been great to meet those alumni and hear their stories when they've been out around the world contributing to make a difference there and then um, choosing to return home. In our case, we're, because of the um, high number of professional programs that we have, we see um, medical doctors becoming doctors in the province, mm -hmm. dentists becoming dentists in the province, nurses, nurses in the province, and it's a significant contribution that we, we're really excited about. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot, and you'll have to check back in with us once you get more of your questions answered and what <laughs> the actual certainly. impact of this will be uh, at post-secondary institutions in Saskatchewan. So, Professor Irene, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, my colleagues. Yeah, and Professor Dostelaire, thank you to you. Thank you very and much. Mr. Pather, thank you. Thank you, Leisha, and thank <laughs> you to my colleagues. That was uh, Tevi Pather, the Associate Vice President, International at SAS Polytech, Isabel Dostoler, the University of Regina Provost and Vice President, Academic, and Professor Irene, the Provost and Vice President, Academic, at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm Leisha Gerbinski. You've been listening to Blue Sky. Tomorrow, we're often thinking about how to bring people from different perspectives together, and so we are asking... How do we bridge the rural-urban divide, and is it really as deep as we think? We have a surprising guest on this. We'll be talking to Blake Berglund, a musician, about his album and how this all connects.